All right, praise, praise God. Well, thank you for singing. What do you think of that Jesus is Lord hymn? Pretty easy, not, not too hard to, to learn that song. We'll sing, sing it again next week, maybe in the next few weeks. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 1. Most churches and most pastors wouldn't touch this book, I don't think. It's a hard book. It's weighty. It's heavy. It's about suffering. It's about loneliness. It's about tears, agony, anguish, depression, darkness, billows of waves, despairing of life. You can hardly find a comforting word in the entire text. You'll find one here and there, a little glimmer. But isn't it true that a little spark or a little light in a very dark room shines really bright? And those little glimpses of hope we get in the text sure gives us uh, the brightness of God's glory and grace. So thank you for taking this journey through the Word of God with me. I've never preached through the book of Lamentations. I've preached through the entire New Testament here and many books I've preached twice in my 30 years here, 25, 30 years. Um, I've preached much of the Old Testament, and, but not Lamentations. The setting of the book I've spent a couple of weeks on, so just to briefly remind you, when God formed the nation Israel, when he called them through Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees, he laid before them some unconditional promises. God gave Israel physical land. He promised physical descendants to Abraham that would be the as large as the stars of the sky, the number of the stars of the sky, or as the sand of the seashore. And God promised spiritual blessings, and those are all unconditional. Israel, the land belongs to Israel, from the Nile River to the Euphrates in Iran and Iraq. That all belongs to Israel. I don't care what, it, what the world says. I don't care what the UN says. I don't care what Hamas or Hezbollah. I don't care what anybody says. God gave that land to Abraham and his descendants. It's this theirs. They haven't, re they haven't received it all yet, but they will someday. So in Leviticus 26, God sets some conditions on Israel as to what generation is going to enjoy the land promise. And God said this. God said, if you hear my word, if you hear my word right here in the Bible, and you obey it, if you have no other gods but me, if you do not love the gods of this world, the gods of sex and violence and money and pleasure and immorality, if you love me, the Lord your God, and have no other gods before me, here's what I'm going to do. I, when, you're, when you're making bread, your, your, your cupboards are going to be full of food. Your refrigerator and freezer, you open it up and it's just going to pour out. You go to your barns and you open up the barn door and the grain is going to fall out like crazy. You're going to look at your flocks and herds and there's just not going to be tens or twenties of them. There's going to be thousands and tens of thousands of, of lambs and herds, of flocks and herds. And you look at your children they're going to be healthy and strong. They're not going to have wasting disease and deficiencies. And one of you Jewish people will chase 10,000 of the enemy. One Jewish man will chase 10,000 of the enemy away. They're going to run away scared. However, if you do not hear my word and you do not obey me, if you will not follow my precepts and have me as your only God, well, then you're going to go to your cupboards to bake bread and there's going to be nothing there. You're going to open up your pantries and your freezers and there'll be nothing there. You'll look at your flocks and herds and they're going to be scrawny and they're going to be few. You will open your barn for the harvest of wheat and grains and there'll be nothing there. The heavens will stop, rain, the rain will stop from the heavens. Your land will dry up, your grasses will dry up, your vineyards will dry up. Your children will not be healthy and many, but they'll be few, and they'll have wasting disease and consumption. You'll be burying men of, many of them, and many of your children will go off to slavery. You will not enjoy the rest and the peace of the land, but the enemy will come, and one of the enemy will cause 10,000 of you to, to run. And I will punish you, God says, seven times more for your sins than what they're worth. So you want to sin against me, God says. I'm going to punish you seven times worse. 
And ultimately, I'm going to take you out of the land and put you amongst other nations and leave you there until you come to your senses and acknowledge that I am the one true God and the Savior of the world. Well, then I'll have you back in your land and you can enjoy all these blessings. So that's how it started. And do you know what Israel did with those conditions? They rebelled against God from day one, and they loved the gods of this world. They, their philosophy was this. Finish it for me. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That is the plan of humanism. The chief end of man is my happiness. And Israel lived every day for their happiness and their glory. Oh, they loved the gods. Of the, you know what Hosea 3 says? Israel loved the raisin cakes of the pagans more than they loved God. It would be like me saying, I love a chocolate-covered donut more than I love God. This is how the Israelites were. And so God sent them prophets to call them back to himself. And one prophet after another would rise up early and speak to the nation and say, you have one true God and Savior. It is Jesus the Messiah. Believe in him, trust in him, turn to him. And they would not, and they would not, and they would not. Until God, and, and God warned them and said, if you, can, if you can consistently turn from me and go your own way, I will spank you. Now, like if, if I had a five-year-old child and they're out in Midway Road, if I don't take them out of the road and spank them for going into the road where it's dangerous, I would be a terrible person. So God said, I will discipline you, and I'm going to do it by the Babylonians. The Babylonians will come down, and take you. They'll destroy your, city, your capital city and take everything out of you. Um, th which is why I started with the wrath of God. God hates sin and unrighteousness. He would not be a holy God if he, if he was not also angry at sin and unrighteousness. You know, in our nine o'clock class, I kind of left, left us open-ended on this. But do you realize, even though we are to act like Jesus and walk in his steps, God hates sin and he hates suffering and, uh, and abuse. He does. If there's child traffickers, we should be angry about that child trafficking and those who do it. If there's women who are being abused by their husbands, if they are being trampled on, we should be absolutely horrified at that and angry about that happening to, to people that are victims of abuse and evil. And so I just want you to know this is the way God is. And God said... I will someday take care of all, of all evil, and, and I will make everything right. So the book of Lamentations is a five stanza poem about the destruction of Jerusalem because they would not hear God. Now listen, not all suffering is a discipline. Not all suffering is because we've done wrong. The whole book of Lamentations, Jerusalem's suffering is because they have done wrong. But listen, many people suffer, like Job Job suffered greatly and he never sinned against God. Your suffering could be that you have not sinned against God. But it's simply a fabric of life. It's part of the fabric of life that we end up suffering. We have loss. We have broken relationships. We have broken finances, broken emotions. We have lots of brokenness in our life and not all of it is a result of our sin. So if you want counsel on that, go to the book of Job where you find out God is good God is good at being God, and God will comfort and help you in the time of need. And, and he is our Savior. Praise God. But here in Jerusalem, in Lamentations, it's tough. It's tough. God's patience has run out on the, on the country and on the capital, and their total destruction happened in July, on July the 18th, 586 B.C. All right. Real quick, just can I, can I come down here? Is that okay? I just want to be close to you all. We have a small group today, so can you all see me? I know, actually, we have nobody running the sound back there, so I'm going to be in and out of the video, but that's okay. But listen, everybody, you, you want it? the book of Lamentations is five poems, and it's written as an acrostic. It is written alphabetically. So in chapter one, there's 22 verses. There's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion are the, are the first six, and uh, seven, seven letters, and it goes all the way through the alphabet. Verse one starts with Aleph. Second word, the second verse starts with Bet, the letter B. The third verse starts with Gimel, 
why would God have a poem written five times, five chapters, with this acrostic pattern? There's three reasons why there'd be an acrostic. Number one, it's easy to memorize in the Hebrew. You would simply go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and you can memorize a verse starting with each letter. God wants us not to forget what happened to Jerusalem hundred, you know, many years ago, 586 BC. He wants us to learn from their mistakes. All right, so that's a good memory lesson. Secondly, if it covers the whole Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Tal, it's the idea of the completeness of suffering. It, it just shows that Jerusalem's destruction and suffering was so complete. It literally covered from A to Z. Like, have you gone through suffering and hurt and loss in your life? Such loss that literally, like, nobody understands and nobody pays attention and you're all alone and it's like, you, it, it, your suffering is so complete, it's like you could say, I, there's, I couldn't suffer anymore without completely being dead. It's from A to Z kind of suffering. I think Lamentations shows that extensive suffering. It's a hard book. It's not a popular book. Most people can't find it in the Bible. I think there's a third reason there's an acrostic. I have suffered, and Melissa and I have suffered in our life, not as much as some of you, obviously, but in our own area and own degree of suffering, we have sat on the couch in the middle of the night holding each other and crying, saying, Lord, what now? What do we do? Uh, we, we'll, what can we do now? I, we don't know. And the A through Z alphabet structure of lamentations, it gives you order and chaos. It helps you find some order amongst all the chaos of suffering. Are you with me, everybody? So we'll walk through this. I'm only going to get through the first six verses of chapter one. It's Jerusalem's calamity. And I'll just tell you right now, there's going to be a series of losses because that's what suffering is. Suffering is a loss of something. It's a loss of hope. It's a loss of friends. It's a loss of possessions. It's a, it's a loss of status. It's, it's a loss of every, it's something. And, and it hurts. And you'll see it in, in this whole portrayal. So are you with me? I'm going to give you, out of each verse, some losses. And I bet you can identify with them. Verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow is she who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become a slave. Here we have a loss of status. Do you all agree Jerusalem is the holy city of God, the city of David? You talk to anybody in the world about Jerusalem, they all know it's the capital of Israel and it's the city of David. It was the shining pillar of all the world where God said, I am going to pick a city on earth and I'm going to dwell in one city and I'm going to call that city Jerusalem. This is the city of God, everybody. And now there's a loss of status. Look, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. Can you picture Jerusalem? You have 100,000 people, 200,000 people. The streets are full. The marketplace is full. The temple mount is full. There's people everywhere. And they're cheering and they're laughing and they're buying. You know what older people do? What do older, pe older people do in a city like Jerusalem? I've, I've been there many times. I know Deb's been there even probably recently. But you know what they do? They sit along the, the benches in the streets and they talk about the good old days. That's what I do. I'm older now. Melissa and I all the time, we talk about the good old days. Oh, those 80s and those 70s and 80s. Those were the good old days. Some of you are saying, that's not old enough. But, but we're saying, oh, those 80s. That was a great time to, to graduate from high school. And, we, we, and so the older people are talking about the good old days. What are the younger children doing in the streets? They're playing bat and ball. They're kicking a ball. They've got a can. They've got some coins. They've got some marbles, and they're playing. Then you've got the families. They're shopping. You hear the footsteps of worshipers going to the Temple Mount, and they're singing songs with guitars and cymbals and harps. And, and it's just a lot of fun. And, and look at the loss. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. You look around Jerusalem, and it's all smoldering. There's ashes and there's not a building left standing, and, this, and everything is deserted. 
There's nobody in the marketplace, nobody in the streets. There's nobody visiting or talking. There's nobody laughing or smiling. It's, it's desolate. Look at the next part. How like a widow is she who was great among the nations? Jerusalem at one time was the top of all the nations, and now it's at the very bottom. It's, it's, she's like a widow. She's not a widow, but she's like a widow. And maybe there's nobody who knows what loneliness is like more than somebody who's widowed. Somebody who has lost their companion that they have eaten with and traveled with and been with for, for many, many years. There's nobody who knows loneliness like that person. And Jerusalem cries out and says, I'm lonely. I'm suffering. The princess among the provinces, at one time she was adorned and decked out like a princess with all the wealth of Solomon, and now she's a slave, forced labor. So there's a loss of status. Look at verse 2. There's a loss of friends. You know when you're suffering, even if you don't suffer for your own sins, people leave you. Your friends leave you. They just, they're not there to help. They're not there to be found. So verse 2, she weeps bitterly in the night. For those of you who are suffering, isn't the nighttime the hardest? You know, my dad passed away not too long ago, uh, a year and a half ago or so. And I, when I ask my mom how she's doing, you know what she says? The days are fine. She keeps busy. She goes here and she goes there. Do you know the hardest time for her? Nighttime. Nighttime. Verse 2, she weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. The city is crying. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. It's a common theme in chapter 1. Five times, there is none to comfort her. There is none to comfort her. You know, we all get comfort from, like we go through something, we've got a church family to comfort us, to say, hey, you're going through a hard time of life. We're here for you. We'll bring you a meal. We'll pray for you. We'll call you. Jerusalem has nobody, nobody to comfort her. And then listen, none of her lovers are there to come. Who are her lovers? You want to know who her lovers are? God said, Jerusalem, would you trust me as your one God? And don't go to the other nations for help. If you just rely on me, I'll fight all your battles for you. Do you want to know what Jerusalem and Judah did? They went to all the other nations and said, would you be my friend and help me in the time of war? So Jerusalem, in, in Jeremiah 27, Jerusalem goes to Edom. She goes to Moab. She goes to Egypt. She goes everywhere but to God. And she forms alliances with all these other nations. And when Babylon comes to destroy Jerusalem, not one nation will come and help. Not one nation that promised they'll be there ended up showing up. All of her treaties that she made with other nations were, were just a lie. So who can we trust if we can't trust even our close friends? We trust the one true God, don't we? And then it says this, um, among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. None of these nations will help. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Do you want to know what else Jerusalem trusted besides these other nations? They trusted their false gods. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 28, do you want to know what God says? O oh, Jerusalem, Jeremiah 2, 28, Judah, you have as many gods as you have thousands of cities. Now, I checked. You want to know Ju Judah, the region of Judah, had thousands of cities and villages, which means Jerusalem and Judah had thousands of gods, and they ran to these gods instead of running to the one true God. They had gods of sex and violence, and they had gods of, of uh, rain and god of sun and god of moon and god of this and god of that, and they ran to their thousands of pagan gods for help, and they would not go to the one true God who could rescue them. Isn't that tragic? So you know what I did, everybody? We live in the grand state of Minnesota. Do you know how many cities in Minnesota? Anybody know? There's 853 cities in Minnesota. I wonder if Minnesota has more than 853 gods. I bet we do. I bet this state 
in the Union that has 853 cities has more than 853 false gods. Gods of entertainment, gods of pleasure, gods of this, gods of that. And we run to those rather than the one true God. Do you know the smallest city in the incorporated city in the state of Minnesota? Has anybody been to Funkley in northern Minnesota? No way! Funkley has 12 people. Wow! I didn't even know that, but they have 12 people. It's an incorporated city. The largest city is Minneapolis with 425,116 people. So, so Jerusalem turned to all of their false gods and all of these nations who promised to help, and not one idol would help, and not one nation would help. They, they lost all of their friends. Listen, if you turn to anybody but Jesus, you lose. You lose it all. Do you understand? If you do not put your trust in Jesus, you not only will go to a burning lake of fire, but you'll go there alone. And, and even though there's many people in the lake of fire, there will be, there's no fellowship and there's no party and there's no friendship in hell. Either you put your faith in Jesus and you have eternal life in heaven, or you reject him and you suffer loneliness with no friends for all eternity. Look at the third verse. Judah has gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtake her dire, in dire straits. All right, so she's not only lost her status, she's not only lost her friends, she's lost freedom and rest. You know what? If you go into sin, you're going to lose your status, you're going to lose your friends, and you're going to lose your freedom and rest. Now, you remember where, where, where did God find Israel? He found them as slaves in what country? In Egypt. And what did he do when they were slaves in Egypt? He delivered them out, brought them to a land of freedom and rest. The promised land was freedom and rest. What did God do with Pharaoh's army? Remember that? They crossed through the Red Sea, and Israel gets through perfectly. And then the Pharaoh and his Egyptian army comes across the Red Sea, and the water comes back and drowns the whole army. God saves Israel like he wants to save you from your sin and from your punishment. Well, look at what it says. It's, it's a loss of freedom and rest. Judah has gone into captivity. They once were free, now they're back slaves, but they're not slaves in Egypt. Where are they? Slaves in Babylon. Under affliction and hard servitude. Do you remember in the days of Moses, God said, I hear the cry of my people. They are under great affliction and heavy bondage. Same words. Israel's back to slavery. Affliction and bondage. She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. No rest. You know, Melissa and I were talking about being old. We're old. And you know, there used to be a day when we were younger, the most exciting thing for us was to be out of our house and get a hotel room. We loved it. We'd be like, let's get out of our house and go to a hotel room and just be together all alone. And, it's in, and now we were driving... Yes, right. And, well, and, and so then, then last night we're, we're like, boy, we're just, we want to go to our own bed. We want to be in our own house. That's where we have safety and rest. And, and so we're different now. And Israel had safety and rest in the promised land, but because of their disobedience, God put them back into slavery and they have no rest. And then all of her persecutors overtook her dire, in dire straits. Rather than protecting them and saving them from Pharaoh's army, God saved the Babylonian army and took down his own people. Do you see how much sin will get you? You listen, everybody, real quick. Can you hear me on this? Sin promises everything. Sin promises happiness and joy and satisfaction and pleasure and fun and life. And you know what it delivers? Nothing but death. And ultimately, everybody who sins should be separated from God in a lake of fire for all eternity. And if it wasn't for Jesus rescuing us when he died on the cross and he paid your sin and rose from the dead, we all would be in a lake of fire with loneliness and dire straits. But praise God for grace. Praise God that Jesus loves us and he died for us. Look at verse 4. There's a loss of joy in worship. If you go back into sin, there's going to be a loss of joy in worship. The roads to Zion mourn. 
It's very poetic. The roads are crying out because no one comes to the set feasts. Three times a year, all Jewish people, all Jewish men were to go to Jerusalem to worship. You had to go to Passover in Jerusalem. That was April. That was March, April. You had to go on the Feast of Shavuot, which would be May or June. Then you had to go in the end of September or October to the Feast of Sukkot. Three times a year. Oh, you guys, from Minneapolis to Duluth, when is it most crowded? Uh, when, are, when is I-35 most crowded? On Friday nights, why? Everybody's doing what? Traveling with their boats up to northern Minnesota. You just come, on, come from the cities on a Friday evening, bumper to bumper traffic. Truck and boat, truck and boat, truck and boat, truck and camper, truck and boat. Um, co you come back on a Saturday night at midnight, there's nobody on the roads. You know, you could fry an egg and have a dinner out there and, and not see another vehicle on I-35. This is what Jerusalem was like. They should have been packed bumper to bumper with chariots and people. There's nobody on the roads. There's a loss of worship, a loss of joy in worship. It says, no one comes to the set feast, verse 4, all her gates are desolate, her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. Why are the young ladies afflicted? Because all the young men are dead or slaves, and there's nobody to marry. The women have nobody to marry, and they're in bitterness. So there's a loss of joy of worship. Look at verse 5. There's a loss of people. Her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies prosper. Jerusalem's enemy is Babylon. They've prospered. For the, oh, wait. Look at verse 5, everybody. Why? Why has this happened? For the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her transgressions. God's anger is judicial. He warned the people and warned the people. He did not fly off the handle. He simply said, I'm sending Babylon. And until the day they broke into the city, God said, if you put your faith in me, I'll stop it. And they wouldn't stop it. When will you believe in Jesus? When will you trust him for eternal life? God said, Jerusalem, will you trust me? Even to the moment of the break-in. And they would not. And many people will hear the message of Jesus and not believe. And when they die, they will perish in their sins. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to believe in Jesus and trust him. Well, her, verse 5 at the end, her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. And I have one more verse to share with you. Verse 6. There's a loss of splendor. And from the daughter of Zion, all her splendor has departed. Every building was laid waste. Every house was broken down. The temple of Solomon was destroyed. Everything was burned with fire. Jeremiah would have been looking out at bloated bodies, vultures eating dead bodies. He would have seen little children whose parents were killed or taken captive, and they're starving to death because they have no milk to drink from their mother. He sees a few older people that somehow survived the battle, and that's it. It is desolate. There's, the enemy appears to have won. All of her splendor, all of the beauty of the city has departed. Can you picture the city of Duluth and every building leveled? The beautiful uh, circular uh, Radisson Hotel with its restaurant demolished. All of its bricks laying on Superior Street. The library all of the buildings, all of the downtown leveled. West Duluth leveled, West End leveled, Piedmont Heights, Duluth Heights, Woodland, Lakeside, Gary New Duluth, Hermantown, all, every building leveled and burned. Can you picture that? All of her splendor has departed. It says uh, there's also a loss of her leaders. Her princes have become like deer. Oh, boy, do I have a problem with deer. Can I tell you my problem? Do you mind if I complain? I want to tell you my problem with deer. I, had a 2000, I have a 2019 Nissan Altima. It's, it was actually in perfect condition, clean as a whistle. I said, I'll, uh, I'm not going to eat in it. I'm not going to get any dirt in it. And I'm driving to church early in the morning one day, and a deer leaps in front of me, and it jumps up, and it lands on my hood. It doesn't even hurt the bumper. The bumper's good. The headlights are good. 
all it does is it jumps up and it sits on my hood and puts a big hole, a big dent in my hood. And then it looked back at me and it kind of smiled. I think it smiled. And it stuck out its tongue like, ha ha. I, by that time, had gone down to a, to a stop and it, it slid off my hood and it bounced off like I gave it a ride at Valley Fair. But now I've got this big crease. And, and, and we went to the... Uh, uh, the, what do you call it, the place to fix it, oh, yeah, auto body shop, there you go, and do you know how much it costs to replace a hood? Uh, oh, so now I want another deer to show up, because I want to, like, get it all taken care of, and I, no, no deer will jump in front of me now, they're, they're afraid of me or something, but, but here, the leaders of Jerusalem are like deer, what's that, how, do, how are leaders like, a, like deer? Do you want to know what happened? Babylon has surrounded the city for 18 months. They have broken down the front gate and they are all pouring in the city and they are killing and burning everything they see. Killing everybody and burning every, and burning every building. Zedekiah is the king. Him and his buddy friends that are running the country, they slip out the garden gate and he runs down the Mount of Olives to the, to the Dead Sea Jericho region and he begins to run up the valley like a deer. Can you picture him? He's running. He's 31 years old, and he's not like the Grandma's Marathon, but he's running for his life. He thinks he's escaped because it's dark, and he's like a deer going down the mountain, and he's going up the valley. And Nebuchadnezzar's men catch Zedekiah. They catch him, and they drag him to King Nebuchadnezzar, and King, King Nebuchadnezzar kills all of his friends with a sword, in front of Zedekiah the king, he kills all of Zedekiah's children in front of his eyes. And then he plucks out Zedekiah's eyes. So Zedekiah is alive, but his eyes have been gouged out. And then he's put in bronze fetters and carried off to Babylon. This is what the verse says. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. Zedekiah was running like a deer through the woods. All the leaders were. And then it says this, they, that flee without strength before the pursuer, and they got caught. Do you see how far sin will take you? Sin will take you farther than you ever thought. It'll bring you lower than you ever could imagine. It'll destroy relationships. There's such loss that comes with it. Again, not all suffering is because of sin, but if you choose to go the route of playing with your sin, you, I will guarantee you'll get these things. They'll show up somehow. So is there any hope? Can I close with this, everybody? Can I close with this? There is a rescue that's available, and it's Jesus. Can I, picture, can I have you picture this with me? Jesus, he's about 33 years old. He is God in human flesh. He is the God that loves Israel. He is the God that allowed the Babylonians to enter Jerusalem and do all this destruction. 586 years later, Jesus is born. God becomes human flesh. Look, as I have two hands with flesh and bone and blood, Jesus had two hands and two feet and eyes and nose and mouth. He is fully God, fully man. And when he went to the cross without any sin of his own, he suffered all of this. Sin, all the consequences of sin, Jesus experienced on our behalf. Was Jesus lonely? Yes. When I'm lonely, I've got Steve and Judy. I can go to their house for dinner anytime, right? Breakfast? All right. See, I'm, I'm never going to be alone because I can always go to their house for dinner or breakfast. I can always give them a call. But Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross bearing our sin, God the Father wasn't there, God the Spirit wasn't there, and nobody was there for him. Nobody. He was utterly alone. Utterly. Lonelier than the city of Jerusalem that sat like a widow. He, he who is the highest, he is the only God sitting in the highest of positions, became a humble servant, and he died for us. Talk about a loss of status. 
Talk about a humbling, humbling scene for God to become flesh and to be beaten and hanging naked on a cross. Jesus suffered everything for us so we could go free. And all of the anger of God that we deserve, Jesus took upon himself. Can you imagine that? And then he says, if you believe in me, I will wipe your sin away and I will give you my righteousness and you can be in my family forever. That is the hope. Jerusalem got what they deserved, but you and I as believers in Jesus never will. You want to know what my sin deserves? It deserves a lake of fire forever and I will never get it because Jesus paid it all for me. And when I put my faith in Jesus, that destination changed from a lake of fire to a home in heaven with Jesus as my best friend. Isn't that amazing? Even though we don't see it yet in Lamentations, it's going to show up, this picture of Jesus. But I want you to have hope that no matter what is going on in your life, you have a Savior who loves you, who gave his life for you and rose from the dead. And then I want you to give all of your allegiance. Just once you're a believer in Jesus, give him your life. Serve him joyfully. He's worth it. He's worth it. There's no one like Jesus. No one. When I first heard this news, I was 26. I tried to kill myself. I was in a psych ward. And I heard this news and I thought, is there such a friend as Jesus? Could this be real? And it is. And I said, Lord, whatever it takes, I will serve you with everything I've got. Whatever the world may say, and though all the world turn against me, and all the world hate you, I want to stand for you. I want to stand for you. And I pray that you will stand with me, uh, with the Lord. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this continuing story and truth of Lamentations. What a hard book. It's not a fun, happy book, but it's a book of judgment and anger and wrath poured out upon a nation who heard and knew the truth but would not believe. Maybe there's people here who have heard the truth but not believed in Jesus. Oh, I pray that they will trust you. I think even at the wedding last night, as the gospel was given to friends and family, maybe people there heard the gospel for the first time. I pray that they would believe. I think of the wedding last weekend as well. Every time we hear the gospel, I pray, so, or I pray somebody would believe. And so um, thank you again. So even though it's a dark book full of the consequences and wages of sin, yet we can learn much. We can learn to run to you, the one true God, full of grace and truth. You have mercy upon us, and you save those who believe. You are a great God and worthy of our praise. So continue your work through this text of Scripture, even tonight at 6 o'clock. In Jesus' name, amen.